Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Or did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what we needed when the sun shone down on the Garden of Eden. Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia, solitopia, solitopia? Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia all over God's green world? Well, we bit that apple and the garden was lost, and so we had to work to pay the cost. And so we went digging into the ground and started to burn many things we found. But don't oh, yeah. you know we're going to have a soul. Started to burn too many things we found. That's the fabulous Dar Williams uh, with uh, Pete Seeger and David Burns uh, singing the Solotopia song. And we got a lot to talk about <clears throat> for Solotopia today. Uh, we're in the midst of some really, really serious big time. Uh, battles <clears throat> over nuclear power plants that will de- determine the future of uh, human life on this earth. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we have two victories to um, uh, discuss and celebrate, I suppose. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, some battles, especially in Ohio, New York, um, uh, and California, to go deep, 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 deep into. So I have three of the best people on earth to be able to do that with. Um, Levi Halevi, are you with us? I am, Harvey. Thank you. Wonderful. And you and I are out here in Los Angeles. Uh, Kevin Camps, uh, have you joined the crew here? Hey, Harvey. I'm here. Kevin, and you're, I assume, in Washington, D.C.? Um, I am. Uh, am I correct? Yes. Okay, good. And Tim Judson, Tim, you with us? I sure am. Thanks, Harvey. Okay, so we've got a full hour here, and we have a ton to cover, and it's all <clears throat> very real, very tangible. Um, we are in the midst of a very <clears> – well, we've got a constitutional crisis going on in Washington, D.C., with the uh, first really serious attempt by an individual to make himself a dictator since Richard Nixon and before that uh, Woodrow Wilson – the only one that was really successful, actually, was Woodrow Wilson. Um, and we could do a couple, three uh, weeks on what's happening in D.C. But uh, um, in some ways, more important is what's happening at the grassroots uh, nuclear power sites. And um, <clears throat> maybe, Halevi, you are the host of um, the Nuclear Hot Seat. And you have a book, um, Yes, I Go in the Dark, which is a really fabulous piece of work I'm uh, I really, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it, and I have a tremendous empathy for you because you were at Three Mile Island uh, when it was going off. Now, I went into central Pennsylvania uh, the week of the year after the accident. Um, uh, I would not have gone there uh, during the accident, but I figured it was reasonably safe after the accident. Uh, a year later, and I'm still alive, thankfully, uh, to talk about it. When I was there, actually, they vented some Krypton gas from the reactor, and uh, there was a cartoon in the local paper that showed Superman (laughs) falling down out of the sky. I'll never forget that cartoon. But uh, (laughs) we we have received notice in yesterday's New York Times that uh, Three Mile Island Unit 1 will finally shut, and it will shut apparently in September. Now, this month uh, we're going to celebrate the shutdown of the Plymouth reactor, uh, Pilgrim in Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts. With those two shutdowns, we're going to go to 96. Uh, there are 98 reactors, uh, op- to my understanding, operating in the United States today. Uh, so Pilgrim and then TMI-1 will take us down to 96. But uh, can you tell us, uh, and, and Tim I, and um, uh, Kevin, I know you're used to patiently waiting. Sometimes, by the way, when we have three guests, one of them has a hard time hearing. So if one of you has a hard time hearing, I'm sorry about that, but we'll, we'll just have to proceed. But Libby, uh, Libby Halevi, you were in central Pennsylvania during the Three Mile Island accident, and now all these years later, Unit 1, which did not melt down, uh, is going to shut. Uh, How does that make you feel? Well, first of all, I'm ecstatic that the bailout didn't work. 
that it is being shut down because it deserves to be shut down. It should have been shut down a long time ago, but I'll take it as soon as we can get it. Uh, the fact that it is scheduled to shut down no later than the day after my birthday at the end of September just gives me reasons to, you know, light a couple of extra candles with it. Um, and I, I was one, I was literally one mile away visiting friends. I was living in Los Angeles and traveled there when it happened. And there is no adequate way to explain to somebody who hasn't been through it or something comparable the level of absolute terror and fear and the lingering doubts about health and safety that happen as a result of being in such a situation. Um, it certainly changed my life, and I know that it's a good thing that a further meltdown didn't happen, a further accident didn't happen, but we have had 40 years now of the continuous generation of nuclear waste on that side. Plus, it has only recently started to come out what the health impact was on the people who lived there. And the government isn't interested in finding out about this. The officials aren't interested. The only people who are interested in this are those who have been affected through the Three Mile Island Survivor uh, website, uh, uh, Facebook page. And, um, you know, those people can never be given back. I cannot be given back all that was taken away as a result of having gone through that experience and the aftermath of it. And I am delighted. I'm dancing the happy dance today. And, of course, then we shift into what do we do with the waste. But we at least get 24 hours of absolute celebration. Tim Judson, you want to comment on the uh, shutdown of Three Mile Island Unit 1? Sure. Well, you know, it... uh, you know, it couldn't be a more fitting conclusion to um, the debate that's been happening over the last few months in Pennsylvania about whether the state is would, was going to pass legislation um, to uh, to you know to give a massive subsidy to the to the uh, operators of nuclear power plants in the state just in order to keep Three Mile Island operating. And thanks to the you know the uh, the, the incredible work of grassroots groups like Three Mile Island Alert and others in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, the, that legislation isn't moving fast enough, and Exelon um, is raising the white flag on TMI, and we're finally going to get that plant shut down <clears throat> so that, you know, and, you know, and opening up the possibility for the cleanup to finally start 40, 40 years after the, after the meltdown. Kevin Camps? Well, I've been thinking about Judith Johnsrud all day since the news came out about the closure, and uh, she was a founder of NEARS. Uh, where Tim is executive director, and she was a founder of Beyond Nuclear, where I work. And uh, she has many claims to fame, but one of them was that with her environmental coalition on nuclear power, they intervened against the building of Three Mile Island in the first place. You know, it's one of these told-you-so kind of moments. March 28, 1979, the meltdown happened, but years before that, there were good people like Judy who were fighting to prevent such a disaster from happening. And then, like you mentioned, the the radioactive releases in the aftermath of the meltdown, Harvey, uh, she fought that. And uh, another thought that comes to mind about uh, <clears throat> Judith is something that Levy said, and that is the waste that's now at the site, as well as the contamination. Judith was one of the hardest nuts to crack in the country on hardened on-site storage, which Tim was a pioneer at hammering out. I was involved with the Statement of Principles in 2006, and she would not sign those principles for a long time, and we had to strengthen them mightily until she would finally sign them. So I'm just remembering all those who devoted so much of themselves to fighting through Mile Island even before uh, the meltdown. Well, I got, I'm looking at uh, on my computer here, I'm looking at a picture of Jimmy Carter in the control room with his little yellow booties. And one of the <laughs> one of the small details about uh, TMI that people um, um, always overlook is that on June uh, March twenty sixth, nineteen seventy nine, uh, Jimmy Carter was in the Rose Garden with Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin signing the Camp David Accords, and it would have appeared at the moment that Jimmy would have had a clear sailing into getting reelected in the second term, uh, from which would have stressed. 1985, and TMI uh, then melted within three, 36 hours of the signing of the Camp David Accords. And, of course, we had approached Jimmy Carter during the 76 campaign 
uh, about nuclear power. And he said in the campaign that he was a fa- in favor of nuclear power if it met certain um, uh, specifications. And Unit 2 was up for grabs at that time, and um, it met none of the specifications that Jimmy Carter laid out, but he let it go online anyway. And then, you know, it melted, uh, as I say, 36 hours after Camp David, and um, it, it basically killed his presidency. And ha- had it not been for TMI, the TMI accident, uh, it's possible that Ronald Reagan would never have become president. And uh, I have to say that if you told me in 1979 that after the Unit 2 uh, went and, and, and there was an explosion inside Unit 2, and uh, uh, I'm going to contend, and I've always contended this, <coughs> people argue uh, there was a big question about <coughs> why, why TMI uh, did have the accident, and then, you know, people came to the various conclusions. The real question is why it didn't blow the roof off. And uh, there's a, a school of thought that says the reason TMI didn't blow its top was because citizen activists <clears throat> in the fight over TMI Unit 2 and getting it licensed, unfortunately, had demanded that the containment at Unit 2 be extremely strong, you know, extra strong, because I, I don't know if the three of you have, but I've flown into TMI, into, uh, into the Harrisburg Airport, and when you do, you, you fly right over the nuke. And they mm-hmm. demanded that, that that containment be extra strong. And it's quite possible that the reason the TMI actually didn't blow its stop was because the, the citizens had demanded a stronger containment. They might want to comment on that, Libby? Libby, do you know about that fight? I remember reading about it, but, of course, the reading that I did was only long afterwards, actually since, since Fukushima, that I've, been, that I've been studying this. And, yes, there was tremendous pressure beforehand to bring up the standards on it. And we all have to be thankful everywhere that citizen activists step forward and fight against nukes and force them into greater safety because they are not figuring out what the impact is going to be on human life and on the safety of the environment. They're just looking at the bottom line. There are a bunch of bean counters, and they don't care about the consequences. They just care about the money. Well, you know, corporations um, have only one genetic imperative, and that's to make money. And so that's what's been happening. I'll tell you, if you'd have told me that uh, TMI Unit 1 would continue to operate for the next 40 years, I, I wouldn't have believed it. I, I, I'm still in shock that 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 thing has continued to operate. Uh, and it is, uh, Tim and, and Kevin, it's a huge victory for uh, Citizen Action, which we can talk about in a minute, but I, I do want to get this in. Um, I, I, as mentioned, I went to central Pennsylvania. Um, um, I was in, I think, uh, January or February of uh, 1980, and I spent the worst week of my life interviewing people there. And uh, Libby, if I'd known you at the time, I would have interv- interviewed you, and I, I would have... I have absolutely no doubt that people were killed by radiation at Three Mile Island. I, I sat across kitchen tables from people who were showing me their, their tumors, their hair falling out, telling me about their stillbirths, showing me. I, I stood across from TMI um, uh, on the Middletown side across the river, maybe 200 yards from the, uh, the plant, and I held in my arms a dog, a black cocker spaniel that had been born with no eyes. I mean, give me a break. Uh, Libby, what, what were your experiences health-wise having been there uh, in, in the middle of the, uh, the uh, accident? My health impact is different from those who have lived there and were <laughs> continuously exposed to what was released and was left in the ground and in the water. Because I was there for three days, we evacuated, I came back from two, and I flew out. So my impact was not continuous. However... In the aftermath of that, we've been able to track it down. The, the combination of whatever I got physically plus the emotional, which nobody ever bothers to factor in. What did this do to people emotionally? What did it do to their blood pressure? What did it do to their heart health? So many other things. Um, in my case, it was my adrenal glands <clears throat> got fried, which led me to extremely low energy and inability to work in the world for many years when we were looking at the wrong diseases for what might have caused it, and only once 
it was identified that it was my adrenal glands and I could get the proper care for that. And that was only within the last six years. Uh, have I been able to come up to, if not my pre-team at Three Mile Island levels, uh, certainly more than I had before because I was basically unable to get through a day without three naps. So that was the way it impacted me physically. Wow. Mentally and emotionally, it shut me me off from everything in the world. Truly, it was post-traumatic stress, and, uh, and there was no way to deal with it. Wow, I do want. I'm going to uh, talk to Tim and Kevin now about the politics here. Uh, I do want to note the last sentence. It's so shocking. The last sentence of the New York Times article in yesterday's paper, uh, talking about uh, this shutdown. The last sentence read: Exxon estimates that the plan to dismantle large components won't begin until 2074. I mean, here we are. We're dealing with these power generators. Um, we're being told how wonderful they are, they are for the national environment. They're not going to pull this thing apart for um, uh, more than 50 years. <laughs> I mean, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of mindset is involved when you build a power plant and you can't, you can't even get into it for 50 years after it's shut? It's insane. All right, so let's talk now. We're in the crit- critical moments here, especially in Ohio, uh, but also elsewhere in the battle to shut these existing reactors down. And we can talk about this later. I do not take particularly seriously. Well, I mean, I take it seriously, but uh, I don't think there's any way that new reactors are going to be built uh, in this country. Uh, maybe one or two will slip through if, <laughs> from Bill Gates's private bank account. I mean, talk about, you know, here we're seeing this spectacle. Everybody in this country assumes that if you have a billion dollars, you're really smart. And we're seeing the spectacle of Donald Trump. And I want to add Bill Gates into that list. I mean, this guy is an idiot. I mean, he's got all this money and he wants to build new nuclear plants. I don't think it's going to happen, especially in like a Voktel. But the, what's critical now is, and we'll turn to that, but what's critical now is the battle over the existing reactors. And this one, in, in, not only is it significant for various, all sorts of reasons, because the TMI one is going to shut. But it's significant politically that we've won this battle. Uh, Tim Judson, do you want to talk about the, the, the basics of the political fight in Pennsylvania that led to this shutdown? And then, Kevin, please jump in. Sure. Well, you know, the, you know, the, the, the same thing has been happening in Pennsylvania for the, last, for the last year that's been happening in other states where, you know, where these old reactors – um, have become uneconomical, and they're you know they're the companies that own them, uh, these massive utility companies um, that have a tremendous amount of political power, have been squeezing state policymakers um, for you know for for multi billion dollar bailouts for these old reactors that are going to be shutting down you know within a few years anyway, and you know essentially as a way to 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 block um, the trans the transformation of our energy system. To relying on renewable energy that's you know that's you know we're, which, which is poised to take place um, you know rapidly in the next few years unless something is done by the utility companies to stop it and that's really what's going on with these bailouts and um, what they do is you know essentially they're you know the, the companies have been playing on the you know the, the the fears of local politicians about job losses in their communities you know when these you know when, when these reactors shut down. And using that as a, you know, essentially as an excuse, um, you know, to, to, to get hundreds of millions of dollars per year in subsidies from ratepayers, which is just totally counterproductive. And what's interesting about what's playing out in Pennsylvania is that, you know, that Pennsylvania isn't just a nuclear state, even though it's one of the most nuclear states in the country, but it's also an, an incredibly, you know, an incredibly big fossil fuel state with fracking and coal. And so the coal and the, and the, and the natural gas, I mean, the nuclear and natural gas companies have been fighting with each other tooth and nail, you know, like, a, like, you know, like these lumbering trolls, um, you know, and, and, and sort of affecting the politics of the situation as well. So I think what we have is, you know, a combination of um, the chaos that's going on within the energy industry over the path forward with our energy supply, um, combined with, um, you know, the really valiant activism of, you know, of local people who, understand the risks of nuclear power and want to see it shut down. Well, why, uh, Kevin, maybe you can jump in and then back to uh, 
Levy and, uh, and Tim, why did we win in Pennsylvania? What was the deciding factor that uh, turned the legislature away from giving the money to Exelon to keep PMI-1 going? Well, just realize uh, that these battles go on. I mean, like Tim said, Pennsylvania is second only to Illinois in terms of number of reactors in a single state. And so if this news is true, and I hope it is, because remember, a lot of bait and switch has been played in New York, upstate New York, in Illinois, where date certain closure dates were set only to use, like Tim said, as leverage to secure bailouts. The threat of job loss, the threat of tax revenue loss was used to secure bailouts, massive bailouts, $10 billion between New York and Illinois, all to the benefit of one company, Exelon Nuclear. So in Pennsylvania, Three Mile Island Unit 1 happened to be the only reactor in the state out of many that was not turning a profit, that was underwater. So all those other reactors are are still after it. Uh, They would like to get the bailout. Uh, The same is true in uh, Ohio. An ironic twist on the Ohio situation is that First Energy Nuclear not only has two plants, two reactors on the Lake Erie shore of Ohio, davis Bessey and Perry, they also own two reactors in Pennsylvania just a few miles over the Ohio state line into Pennsylvania getting towards Pittsburgh. That's Beaver Valley Units 1 and 2. And the proposed bailout in Ohio, which keeps morphing by the day, it seems, what's being proposed, is so loosely written that the $150 million per year that Ohio ratepayers would fork over to First Energy, this bankrupt company, money is fungible. It could even be used to prop up Beaver Valley Units 1 and 2 in Pennsylvania. So how's that for a, for a trick move? Ohio ratepayers paying to subsidize reactors in Pennsylvania. So it's... Uh, That's why I say I hope it's true. We're going to have to remain vigilant, but we're certainly going to have to remain vigilant on all these other reactors in Ohio and Pennsylvania that are that are still after those bailouts as we speak. Well, I mean, if I can pile on on that, it's you know what 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 Kevin said is actually true. You know, we 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 we, you know we seem to have won round one over the Pennsylvania bailout with uh, you know with 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 the closure of TMI. But what Exelon and the other nuclear companies have done in Pennsylvania has turned the debate from, you know, subsidizing uh, TMI, you know, the, the most, the smallest and most uneconomical nuclear plant in the state, to subsidizing all of the rest of them. And, you know, what, and so, you know, essentially Exelon seems to be sacrificing uh, the one reactor that it doesn't want to operate anymore in order to get subsidies for the rest of them. And that's, you know, and, and, that, and so, the, you know, we're, we're going to be right back fighting this again in a few months. Well, I'm assuming here that the, the New York Times ran this story yesterday, that would be May 8th, um, with some assurance that the, the towel has been thrown in uh, on TMI-1. Um, uh, you know, yeah, well, actually, I did issue a press release. So, you know, um, we've just seen those reversals, I, like, you know, specifically in upstate New York where reactors gave date certain closure dates and said, you know, we really mean it. If you don't give us the subsidy, we're closing on this date, and the subsidy was given. So here, you know, um, you've got Exelon, you've got state legislators in Pennsylvania who are huge servants to Exelon who have uh, apparently raised the white flag, as Tim said. But just remember what else they're up to. So that's what we have to watch out for. I think uh, there's a, a, a... Yeah, have anything to jump in on this one? Yeah, um, I interviewed Eric Epstein of Three Mile Island Alert about, uh, this was before the bailout, and uh, about some of the unique situations in Pennsylvania that would not necessarily play out in other states. But I would like to take a step back from the front lines where we're talking about, you know, jobs and subsidies and money and all of that, and go into a macro argument that I think that we as a movement need to make. And that is that people have lost track of what the negative impact is of radiation on human body and health and safety and children and fertility and all the rest of it. So if I was born, I I lived through the 1950s. I lived through the aftermath of Three Mile Island. So I at least have a base level understanding. But so many of the people who are, say, even under 50, don't understand what's wrong about nuclear. And so they're easily swayed by economic arguments. 
where there's a much more personal one, as in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kate Brown in her book Manual for, uh, Manual for Survival about Chernobyl points out that sperm count has gone down by 60% since the 1940s. And she links that up with nuclear. There are other aspects of human health and, and birth defects and miscarriages and the like that I think we need to be mining for talking points about what we're really talking about here. Because the left brain side of it is all these important issues that have been brought up about money and tax base and jobs and all the rest – all of which are, are being addressed in different ways by both sides. But the one thing that is being shunted to the side repeatedly are the concerns particularly of the women, particularly of the mothers, who are in that area and have seen the consequences of Three Mile Island within their families. And I think that by finding a way to frame that argument and let people understand that this is not clean, this is not green. Only if you look at the moment of energy generation, like through like, like, through like a tiny hole in a sheet of steel, can you see it being carbon neutral and everything else is carbon intensive, but then there's the radiation. We've got to find a way to get those very important arguments, which may be dismissed as being emotional, but there's nothing wrong with emotions in this. We've got to get that into the argument or we run the risk of people who don't understand the difficulties going the wrong way and voting for the jobs and the money as opposed to realizing that what they're voting for is really the destruction of the human race. Well, it's actually quite remarkable, um, Levi Halevi, that um, in, in none of this, and, and, I, and Tim and Kevin, you can take this up, but uh, we've been following these debates, these fights, over the bailouts, and in virtually none of it is is the the calculation on health and health or safety for that matter. I mean, th- these people just when you raise these issues of of people dying in the neighborhoods, which uh, you know uh, Joe Mangano and the Radiation Health Project have clearly documented, and which you, Lee, and I have have seen uh, along with Tim and Kevin in, in the in the aftermath of Three Mile Island. In Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, are, we've got people out there <clears throat> on the pro-nuclear side denying any of it. I mean, Joe Mangano has has demonstrated clearly that when nuclear reactors open, the infant death rate goes up, and when they close, it goes down. Now, the, the states, uh, Pennsylvania included, do a, a great job of not studying any of that. I mean, after Three Mile Island, the state of Pennsylvania uh, discontinued its tumor registry and, you know, did everything in its power to no longer look uh, for health impacts. I'm going to guarantee you that with the shutdown of TMI-1, the infant death rate in, in central Pennsylvania will go down. And it would uh, with Perry and Davis Bessey and uh, the four upstate reactors in New York. But it is not part of the public dialogue. It's outrageous. And, uh, you know, I'm going to reiterate again, there is absolutely no doubt that Three Mile Island killed people. And yet you still hear these guys running around saying, no, no, there were no, nobody died at Three Mile Island, which is a complete lie. They're saying that uh, 31 people died at Chernobyl when we have a clear indication that well over a million died. The radiation released at Fukushima has been charted at least the cesium at 130 times or more the amounts of cesium released at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for God's sakes. So, you know, the, the, the health aspects uh, have not really entered in, unless I'm missing something, uh, Tim and Kevin, uh, has it been part of the debate in these, in these bailout fights? Well, I mean, you know, the you know the, the activists have been raising the issues about why we you know why you know why, why we shouldn't be using nuclear power in all of these cases. But what you're pointing to, Harvey, is you know is a really important dimension of the of the overall problem, which is you know that you know I mean contrast this a little bit with what's going on with climate change. In the last few years, you know, we've we've actually really sort of you know brought to the forefront and you know and 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 called out. Uh, what you know, this 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 uh, the strategy of climate denial that the fossil fuel industry you know has sort of rolled out over the last couple of decades to basically you know prevent there being any sort of you know national consensus around the around the need to address the the, the climate crisis. But you know we've been dealing with 
you know, a parallel problem of nuclear denial for decades longer than that, um, which has been, you know, which comes straight out of the origins of nuclear power, nuclear weapons in the Manhattan Project and the, you know, the, and the program of national secrecy around this technology. And, and part, part of the, you know, the, one of the essential components of the whole enterprise of nuclear power and nuclear weapons has been this, this practice of denying that there's really any meaningful public risk and public health and you know public health impact to the, you know to, to this essentially dangerous technology and you know, that has had tragic consequences for everyone throughout the entire you know nuclear fuel chain from uranium mining up through you know the operation of nuclear reactors to the dumping of radioactive waste and you know and policymakers have been you know under the influence of this massive um, coordinated plan or you know or, or, or agenda to deny that nuclear power has any environmental impact. So we have to get past that. Uh, uh, Kevin, you want to jump in on that? Well, one of the reactors in Ohio that's uh, lined up for these bailouts, if it ever goes through, and we've held them off for many long years, which is a victory in itself, but here they're back at us again like never before. So Davis Bessey just happens to be one of the most dangerous atomic reactors in the United States and perhaps the entire world. And just to get that point across, I was at a Chernobyl 20th anniversary uh, shadow conference in Kiev, Ukraine. It would have been 2006. And there was a Chernobyl whistleblower who was speaking either Ukrainian or Russian, and I was listening to his presentation over headphones that were translating his presentation into English. And I heard him say himself, audibly davis bessie before i heard the translation and i almost fell out of my chair and what he said was hey we've been talking about chernobyl we've been talking about russian rbmk reactor designs how risky they are of course they are but you know it's not just russian designs let me tell you about an american design a davis bessie and what he talked about was the hole in the head fiasco that came to light in 2002 this massive corrosion in the reactor lit at Davis Bessey, that was the nearest thing to a meltdown, the closest call since Three Mile Island decades earlier. And so when we entered the fight at Davis Bessey in 2010 to try to block the 20 year license extension, which is the only reason it's still operating right now, it should have shut down on Earth Day 2017. That was the end of the 40 years. We uh, compiled a list of all the near misses at Davis Bessey over the decades. I mean, the first one was a Three Mile Island precursor incident 18 months before Three Mile Island because Davis Bessie is a twin design. And you just keep adding episodes of near misses at Davis Bessie. So what we titled that compilation was Another 20 Years of Radioactive Russian Roulette on the Great Lake Shore. And that's what we've entered. You know, we're uh, a couple years into the Davis Bessie license extension. And the irony of the bailout in Ohio would be that Ohio ratepayers would be paying for that radioactive Russian roulette, this ever deepening risk with age related degradation, sailing ever deeper into uncharted territory of risk. There's many risks at Davis Bessey, uh, reactor pressure vessel embrittlement, uh, that corrosion problem that's never gone away. Uh, the, re- the radioactive waste in the pools, Davis Bessie's on a short list of pools in this country, about 13 of the pools in this country that have suffered leakage. So a high-level radioactive waste storage pool that is leaking. So um, that's the irony is that Ohioans are, are being looked to to pay for their own ever-increasing risk at Davis Bessie. Right, and, there, and there's no uh, sense in the discussion from the utility side uh, or the supporter side that the reactor needs to be um, uh, inspected. You know, they've, they've got this uh, nuclear power portrayed as some kind of black box that just works and works and works, and the only question is, you know, do we turn it on or off? Uh, there's no, you know, what we have now in this country is 98 separate issues here. It's not a, there's no, the, the abstract debate about nuclear power is meaningless. If, if what we're t- what we're dealing with is is 98 soon to be 96 uh, machines uh, that that uh, you know it's like buying a and they don't want to look at it's like buying a car and you don't see if the block is cracked or, or the brakes work and it's terrifying I mean we cannot get in Ohio and I've been following it more closely in Ohio than elsewhere but it's also true in California we can't get people to look at these reactors as individual. Um, entities, you know, they're all Corvairs, Pintos, and Edsels, for God's sakes. 
And, uh, you know, and, and plus we have these, these idiots running around. You know, finally they get the people to take global warming seriously because it's being used as a pretext to keep nuclear power plants operating. I mean, that is completely and utterly insane. And, it's, it's, you know, the same people who are uh, uh, dumping all over us for worrying about global warming are now using it as an excuse to keep nuclear power plants operating. I mean, and they're calling nuclear plants emission-free and carbon-free. I mean, you know, talk about your adrenals going bad, Levy. I mean, that just drives me absolutely crazy. The languaging makes me nuts, but it's also a field of of specialty for me as to, you know, how language is used to move people. And the problem we're facing is that the nuclear industry has been allowed to control the Mm -hmm. languaging and the framing of this argument. And the way I explain it to people Mm -hmm. is... If that they're trying to say that it's carbon free, and if you put up a steel plate in front of you and hold it up in front of you and drill a tiny pinprick of a hole all the way through and squint through it at the sole moment of the energy generation, then yeah, they can get away with it. But you take that steel plate away from blocking your vision, and you see the entire fuel chain from uranium mining, which leaves behind the tailings and the poisoned land and water and people there. Then there is transport, and they're not using electric vehicles for this. All of this is carbon intensive. Then it's the refining. Then it's the manufacturing. They bring it to the facility, which had to be built in the first place, which was very carbon intensive. And you've got this split instant where it's not. But then afterwards, we've got these thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of years of high-level radioactive waste that's going to have to be tended. And there's no way that that's going to be carbon-free. I mean, the nukes themselves aren't even carbon-free because they don't generate their own electricity. It's not like they're generating it and they, they, they run a line back in to operate the plant. They've got to pull it off the grid, and God only knows where that energy is coming from. So it is a carbon-intensive, dirty technology from start to finish, except for maybe this tiny thing, which is what the nuclear industry wants people to look at. And we have to find that way to take that block away from their eyes so they see the whole thing and see the way that they are being conned. Well, nuclear power plants do emit carbon-14, and they do heat the environment directly. Now, you know, we're told that that's a very small uh, piece (laughs) of the puzzle, but the reality is that they do emit carbon-14, and they do heat the environment directly. So, uh, you know, let, let, let's deal with reality here. Tim Judson, um, what is the fight like in New York now? Uh, is there any um, resistance? Has anybody come forward to challenge the ongoing bailout of these four reactors? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, we, we're actually still involved in a lawsuit um, to, to have the whole bailout overturned. and. Um, that's you know wending its way through the court right now. We're you know we're waiting on a on a ruling or you know or a, or a hearing date to be set. Um, you know to you know to at least resolve the you know the um, the you know the, the the first legal challenge to the uh, to, to the bailout. Um, you know I think what's also going on right now is um, sort of a parallel issue, which is that um, you know there's there's four reactors that are being bailed out um, under this massive subsidy. Um, to continue operating, but there's also two reactors that are going to be that, that are going to be closing in the next in the next two years at the Indian Point nuclear power plant just north of New York City, and you know what we're seeing happening now actually is um, a very a very high level um, industry financed uh, publicity campaign um, to essentially you know uh, create a sort of the the public impression. That Indian Point, uh, Indian Point's closure, the closure of this large nuclear power plant in New York City that people have been working for decades to, to close, is going to be turned into a negative um, by uh, essentially the, the the public impression that it's going to be replaced with fossil fuels. And um, this is, you know, going back to you know the other item, other things we've been talking about. Um, this attempt to essentially muddy the waters and pit different segments of the environmental movement against one another, um, you know, by, you know, essentially, you know, making it seem like the closure of nuclear power plants is bad for the climate. And um, this is a really pernicious strategy that the industry is using 
um, you know, to keep the environmental movement divided while they clamor for all of these subsidies. And, you know, we're pretty sure that, you know, I mean, the, the, the closure of Indian Point is going to happen. Nothing is going to change that at this point. Um, but this is essentially, you know, a way to, to, to try to get the public condition uh, to continue paying the bailouts for all of the rest of you know, the nuclear plants in New York State. And um, this is, you know, th- th- this is really, you know, an issue that we have to take on um, to, you know, to essentially try to unify or reunify the environmental movement around the things that are really the solutions to all these problems, which is sustainable energy. And, you know, whether you're working to stop fracking or working to stop, uh, you know, coal mining, working to stop fossil fuels or working to stop nuclear, the solutions to all of these issues are the same. And, you know, what we're seeing happening in California and Germany and, you know, in other, in other parts of the world is that, you know, renewable energy, you know, can take off and expand quickly enough uh, to be able to address the climate crisis and phase out nuclear power. Um, but, you know, we have to have, you know, the public consensus around making that happen as opposed to fighting over, you know, which dirty energy source we're going to prefer over others. Well, Tim, real quickly, what makes you so sure that uh, Indian Point is going to shut down? How, oh, how, well, how? I mean, it, it's, it's happening. I mean, you know, there, 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 there's a legal agreement between the state, uh, the environmental organization Riverkeeper, and Entergy to do it. I mean, Entergy's already cut a deal to sell the plant to another company once it's closed for decommissioning. I mean, this is, and, you know, and, and, and there's only one way to get out of it, which is for there to be, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, a sort of an electric, you know, grid emergency, um, you know, necessary to keep the lights on. And the state has already guaranteed um, that that's not going to happen by putting in all of the system upgrades that are necessary for the point to turn off um, so that that won't happen. Um, so Indian, Indian, Indian Point is closing. There's no doubt about that, and, you know, in my mind or, um, you know, or almost anybody else's in New York. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but the issue is whether, you know, we're going to be able to wean the state off, the, the state off of the other nukes, um, you know, and, and end these subsidies. What, uh, what court are you in uh, fighting the uh, bailout of the other four reactors? Uh, well, it's the New York State Supreme Court, which, you know, contrary to the way that the federal courts are organized, is actually the lowest level of the New York State court system. So, um, you know, this is, you know, we, we, we filed this lawsuit, um, you know, a, a couple of months after the bailout was adopted. And it's, you know, been taking a while to, uh, you know, to, to get to a ruling, but we should be having that sometime this year. Okay. So, and those are, there are no other, the, the two at Indian Point, what, what are the dates for shutdown at Indian Point? Uh, so Indian Point 2 will shut down permanently in March of 2020 and Indian Point 3 in March of 2021. Well, it can't be too soon, but, uh, okay, I'm going to take your word for it that they're going to Well, shut. I mean, you know, Kevin they, they, they keep on having safety incidents and, you know, and, uh, and equipment, equipment problems at that, at that plant. So, yeah, it's being held together by, you know, by, by their nuclear equivalent of, you know, bubble gum and duct tape. But, um, you know, so, you know, it, you're right. It, you know, I mean, everyone wants to see those reactors shut tomorrow. Um, and we're hoping to yeah. get through the next two years incident free. Well, all the reactors all across the country are being held together that way. Um, very quickly, uh, I want to move on to Kevin in Ohio. Um, have any of the major politicians in New York uh, come out to criticize the uh, Cuomo's bailout of the four? I'm thinking specifically of Kirsten Gillibrand who's, of course, running for president, the uh, senator. Uh, what has she had to say about, about the bailouts, if anything? Sorry, are you asking me, Tim? Yes, Tim, please, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the Gillibrand and the other, you know, high-level elected officials in New York haven't, uh, haven't said anything against it. There is opposition in the state legislature, and the state legislature um, you know, uh, introduced legislation uh, two years ago to uh, to try to to try to overturn uh, the subsidy. Um, you know, the problem was is that um, you know the the governor was the one who made the subsidy happen, and he wasn't going to you know he 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 was not going to he, he was going to veto that legislation. And he's still holding fast on this, the governor of uh, Cuomo. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're you know what. Well, what we're anticipating is there's going to be another big fight next year. Um, you know, every four to five years, New York State, um, you know, by state law, has to adopt um, a state energy plan. 
And in the previous state energy plan and that was issued in 2015, uh, where they actually set really ambitious goals for, you know, 40% emissions reductions by 2030, uh, 50% renewable energy by 2030, you know, big, big improvements in energy efficiency. Um, that state energy plan didn't say a single word about propping up nuclear power plants with, you know, with massive subsidies. But a year later, they, you know, the, the governor pushed through that policy anyway. And, um, you know, uh, you know, one of our allegations in the lawsuit is that the, uh, is that the, the state public service commission, violated the state energy planning law mm-hmm. by, by by putting in this massive nuclear subsidy that wasn't part of the state energy plan. And we're really concerned that when the next state energy plan gets, uh, you know, gets drafted next year, uh, that they're going to, to try to put um, support for these, for these subsidies in there at that point. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we're working with, um, with environmental groups in New York state to make sure that doesn't happen. In the, in the course of the debate and, and even to this point, has anybody in New York sought to inspect these reactors and see what kind of shape they're in? Kim well, Justin? nobody has any authority to. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, by federal law, uh, preempts anyone else, any, any other state or you know, or you know, or you know, or local agency from uh, from you know from from doing anything about nuclear safety. Well, but it can be. But that, that's the point. If it's if it's framed in terms of safety. That's one thing, but what about, what about framing it in terms of the economic value of the asset? I mean, these plants are being bailed out based on the idea that they have economic value. If nobody, it's like, again, buying a car with a cracked block. I mean, if, if, if nobody, it should not be the NRC, well, of course, I'm advocating it, but it should not be the NRC's uh, jurisdiction to do an economic um, assessment of the value of these reactors. That should be reserved to the people that are bailing them out. Uh, it seems sure. to me well, there would be. Yeah, a- I mean, if I mean, if, if you want to look at it purely from the standpoint of economics, and you know, and and you know, I really appreciate you know Levy's you know point before about about this this ultimately not being an economic issue, even though those are the terms we're forced to debate it in. Um, you know, these these reactors have no. You know, no, I mean, no, no economic value in terms of, especially in terms of, of addressing a situation like climate. I mean, you know, I mean, of the four reactors that, you know, that, that are being subsidized in New York, two of them are going to be closed by 2030 anyway, because their licenses expire and they're two of the oldest reactors in the world. Um, you know, and the, 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 you know, uh, one of the, one of the other two was already going to close before the before the bailout was enacted because uh, because because it was uneconomical and unprofitable to operate. So you know if we're talking about how we're going to be meeting our emissions goals to mitigate the climate crisis. You know, nuclear power isn't going to be around long enough to make a difference. So why are we putting billions of dollars into subsidizing these old reactors instead of putting it into renewables and efficiency? And you know there was actually a study done. Uh, during the dur- during the, the the debate over the over the nuclear subsidy, that showed that if en- if New York created an energy efficiency program that was really ambitious, like what's happening in some other states, that uh, they they could actually reduce electricity consumption in New York by 2030 by the same amount of electricity as these four reactors generate, but saving ratepayers three billion dollars in you know in cost. So instead of Saving three billion dollars, um, you know, um, you know, to uh, you know, and, and you know, and, and on by by doing energy efficiency, the state is spending seven and a half billion dollars to prop up these old reactors that are going to that are going to be shutting down anyway. I mean, that's not how we're going to solve the climate crisis by making decisions that cost ten and a half billion dollars more to do less. Uh, let's switch. Thank you, Tim. I mean, it's it's mind boggling. Mind-boggling how stupid this is. Uh, let's go to the pinnacle of stupidity here, which is Ohio. And nobody knows more about Davis, Bessie, and Perry than, than Kevin Camps. So, Kevin, what is happening now in Ohio? They're, they're, they're really, obviously, they're down to the wire here. This is the, the big all-out push now to bail out uh, Perry and Davis, Bessie. You've got a you know heavily gerrymandered state legislature with big Republican majorities. You have a Governor, who's you know pro nuclear, Mike DeWine, uh, give us a, a, a sense of the of the battle here. Well, sadly, I mean, listening to what Tim just said about New York, uh, Ohio Republicans who are in the pocket of First Energy have been very effective, unfortunately, tragically, at sabotaging renewables in the state of Ohio. 
So by creating a very strict, impossibly strict setback distance for wind turbine towers in Ohio, for the past five years, they have effectively sabotaged the development of wind. And there's tremendous wind potential in Ohio. I mean, the Lake Erie shore is one of the best potential wind power generation sites in the country. And then you've got great transmission already there. You've got major cities that need the electricity, like Cleveland. And so, unfortunately, the uh, Republicans at the behest of First Nuclear have been very effective at just blocking renewable development in Ohio. And this latest bailout would be, you know, another chapter in that with no uh, with no end date attached to it. And First Energy has been so effective at campaign contributions and lobbying in Ohio at the state level that they've uh, they've essentially handpicked the current House of Representatives Speaker, Householder is his name, ironically, and he is the sponsor of this latest bailout attempt. So it's it's just very uh, corrupt cronyism that's going on. Um, and we're lucky to have some great allies on the ground, though, like Environmental Defense Fund, which is not anti-nuclear by any stretch of the imagination, but they are anti-subsidy, and especially in this circumstance. And so they've actually helped lead the fight in Ohio against these subsidies. And like I said, we have held them off for several long years, despite their best efforts. And another ally I need to mention is the Beyond Coal campaign at Sierra Club, because it's not just the reactors that would get bailed out. It's also, and as I said, it's amorphous. It morphs by the day, but coal and even natural gas is still in the running to receive these subsidies. It seems to just be solar and wind that gets excluded every time. So it's a fast uh, moving target in Ohio. A lot of good people fighting. Some more good news would be that uh, a couple pieces. One is on the latest round of bailout bill, which again is mostly about the reactors, there were more than 80 comments submitted in the last couple, three days at the Ohio State Legislature. Only a couple of them were in favor of the bailout, and guess what? It was First Energy uh, representatives. There were five who maintained neutrality, including the head of the Public Service Commission, or the, the PUCO, the Public Utility Commission of Ohio. But then the vast majority, like 75 of the 82 comments submitted, were opposed to the bailout. So there's some good news. And you mentioned the bankruptcies, Harvey. Some more good news is the bankruptcy judge overseeing First Energy's bankruptcy did not allow for First Energy parent company to simply walk away from the coal messes and perhaps even the nuclear messes that it has made in Ohio. They just wanted to walk away and have no liability for the messes they've made. They've created this spinoff company called First Energy Solutions that would protect the mothership and its money. And the bankruptcy judge said, nope, you're not walking away from this mess you've made. So you know, a call out, a shout out to Environmental Law and Policy Center of Chicago, Howard Lerner, they were really uh, going after the inadequacy of the decommissioning funds at the Ohio reactors for, for years now under the uh, NRC's emergency enforcement petition process. So a lot of good people doing a lot of good work in Ohio on this. So what's the, what's the key to winning in Ohio? I mean, it's not, not, it's not a done deal that we've lost it, right? I mean, we still have a chance to nope. stop. No, it's not a done deal. Um, Yeah, we just got to keep redoubling efforts and showing up at every juncture like we just did the last couple days with, like I said, 75 of the 82 testimonials were opposed to the bailout, just like happened a couple weeks back with the previous iteration of the bill. So a lot of work to do in Ohio. I mean, some bad news is the Democrats in Ohio, who are a small minority in the Ohio State Legislature, uh, I don't know what they're thinking. they said, yeah, we support, you know, continuing forward into the future with with these old reactors and bailing them out, subsidizing them. So obviously a lot of huh, education has to take place in Ohio. Right. Kevin? Well, we're almost Kevin, at the end. Kevin, question. I mean, we could go on. If, if maybe, I may, maybe, Harvey, uh, Tell us who you are. What, if anything, maybe, can people to, outside of Los Angeles, uh, excuse me, outside of Ohio, do to be for the effort that's going on there? Uh, well, I encourage the, folks, uh, if you know folks in Ohio, to to activate them. Let them know that now's the time to be in touch with their own governor, their own state legislators. So just spread the word to folks you know in Ohio or groups you're a part of that have a presence there. Just alert them. Same, as, same in Pennsylvania. 
We'd be however you are author. You have the nuclear hot seat. You're author of uh, Yes, I Go in the Dark. How do people get a hold of you? They can go to nuclearhotseat.com. They can send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. I invite them to the website where they can sign up for an email once a week with each week's um, episode there. And there's an archive of more than 400 episodes that they can go and scroll back and check into if they want to find out about any of these issues. Tim, thank you so much, Libby. You're always fabulous. Tim, Tim Judson? Uh, yeah, thanks, Harvey. Um, you know, so people can find us on the web at uh, www.nears.org, nirs.org, or on Twitter and Facebook um, at nearsnet. Okay, and Kevin Camps, you're at Beyond Nuclear as always. We will have you all yeah, back. Yeah, beyondnuclear.org. That's us. Yes, indeed. And beyondnuclear.org. Let's celebrate two more shutdowns and 96 to go. Thank you both. And thank you, crew in New York. We'll see you next week. Solatopia, 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 don't you know we're gonna have a Solatopia?